my life lesson is if anything I've done has inspired you in any way, just know my family was not rich. I have never been well off. Uh, the things that I've done are simply because I wanted to and I saved up. Hello and welcome to Here in L.A. 100 episode special edition. Today... We're turning the tables a little bit. Mr. William G., Mr. Film the Police L.A., is going to interview me, Tony Pierce, about the 100th episode. But as you will see, I don't fall for those kind of situations very easily, and I turn the tables on William, and we end up talking about him a little bit too, which is good because it's good to catch up. It's it's nice to catch up. And so... uh, you're going you're gonna to hear a, a, a little longer episode than normal to celebrate our 100th episode, which is a crazy special episode because it, uh, it, it, it's not easy to do these, and uh, I can't believe we made it to 100 in exactly two years. This has been amazing, and I want to thank all of you for listening and for telling your friends and all of our guests. We've had all these guests many of whom I've never met before and um, sometimes you have an idea of what you want something to be and sometimes it ends up crappier than you thought in this case it turned out way better so cheers to our first 100 episodes Um, I believe we have to do uh, 1500 before this is all over so we have yet to begin to well I guess we have begun to rock so (laughs) with no further ado here's William G hey everybody this is episode 100 of here in LA and so Mr. William Mr. Film the Police LA asked very politely as he as he always does he's usually polite Unless you're not polite to him. He asked if he could interview me for the 100th episode, which I can't imagine a better person because technically William was our first guest and um, and he ended up being our second guest. But he has now done two episodes, which nobody else has done two. Um, maybe Zora. Eh, one and a half for her. But now you're going to do three because we've got him. So, everybody, welcome William. Hey. <laughs> Woo, sound effects. <laughs> yeah. William, thank you for coming to my house. Thank you for having me. And uh, it's great to have you here. Uh, for those of you who can't see in my house, maybe Obama can see in this house, your leg is up because um, you kicked somebody in the ass so hard that you broke your foot. Is that is that what happened? I mean, I wish. Actually, it's funny. Yeah, I broke my foot running. I was jumping off a curb because I saw a dog coming. I was running with my dog, and I jumped off the curb, and it landed funny, and I heard a pop. <clears throat> but it's funny because earlier that day, I kicked a car on La Brea and Sunset. You know how you have those people when you're a, you're a pedestrian, you're crossing the street, right? And they're going to make a right-hand turn right through the fucking crosswalk. And then they see you, and they have a choice. They could stop or they can keep on going, but they choose to keep on going while they wave to you saying sorry you're not sorry oh yes i i mean i gave them a dent in their car you did yeah of course every every time (laughs) every time i see that you're gonna get the car is gonna get kicked and i'm not gonna kick it right at the edge of the door i'm gonna kick in the center where it's gonna dent (laughs) where it's not reinforced that's every time has anybody ever stopped their car and and tried to yeah oh the best time i was running my dog i was on a corner of uh I think it was uh, Santa Monica and Fuller. Uh-huh. What is that? Is that like Astro Burger or something right there? Yeah. <clears throat> and on one side, Fat Burger on the other side. Yeah, the other mm-hmm. side of that, which does incredibly well. I've never eaten there. It <laughs> the just Fat looks, Burger. Well, no, I've eaten a Fat Burger. Oh, the I, Astro Burger. I've oh, met, that's blowing up that one. It's always busy. Straight yeah. through COVID, it was always busy. Always. Yeah. But I was running there, and a car made a right-hand turn as I was running my dog. So I went and pounded on his car oh as he's turning and he stopped and he said, why are you going to hit my car? I said, cause you almost fucking hit me. Yeah. He said, I didn't get anywhere near you. I said, I, you got close enough that I was able to hit your fucking car. <laughs> right. 
<laughs> right? And so he was so angry. So he gets out of the car. He's like I, pissed off. He had glasses on. His glasses fell and he stepped on them. And I just sat there laughing at him. And he was just completely defeated. Oh, my God. And I finished up my run. Uh, is that Plumber's Park over there? Yeah. Yeah. I love Plumber. I love Plumber's Park. I'm by there all the time. Plumber's I think that's technically WeHo, right? That is WeHo. Yeah. I mean, so one side of the street, Plumber's Park is WeHo. Okay. Go on the opposite opposite side of the street on Fountain, and that's no longer WeHo. So if there is an incident that happens just on the other side of the street from Plumber's Park, that's LAPD territory yes. versus uh, LASD. Well, okay. William came here to interview me, but I'm I have questions for you, sir. Can we just get into the questions I have for you, or do you want to go first? You're the guest. You can do whatever you want. I, I, you're, this is your hundred. Well, why don't we do party. this? Why don't we start with your questions for me? Let me be a polite yeah. host, and then we can get on. To I, I have some questions that yes. I've, I've always wondered. Right, okay. just some basic stuff like how did you get out here? What brought you from Chicago mm -hmm. to L.A.? I senior year of high school, mm. I went to the Rose Bowl game. It was Illinois versus UCLA. Mm. And I always thought that there was, I wanted to go to the University of Illinois. All my friends were there and were going there. And um, I thought I wanted to go down there. I was also, have, I, was, I was a band nerd in high school. So I love marching band. Uh, University of Illinois has a great marching band. But my grades weren't very good. Mm. So I knew I was going to have to do a couple of years of junior college wherever I was. And I came out here and I saw the Rose Bowl game. And it was January. Yeah. And it was just perfect weather. And I was like, am I out of my mind? Of course I'm going to come here. And so it was decided like that January that I'm coming out here. And so I did um, a couple years of junior college at Santa Monica College, which I highly recommend to people, especially. I mean, it's so weird that teenagers are supposed to like know what the hell we're going to do with our lives. Mm -hmm. And we and now we spend all this money in college and we still don't know what we're doing. So I did a couple years of junior college, didn't cost a lot of money. I had some amazing jobs while I was working through junior college. One at a record store, one pumping gas in Beverly Hills at an all full serve gas station, one selling TVs on commission. And I got, and I was living in Inglewood for some of it. So I, I grew up in an all white uh, suburb. So it was nice to be in a black community for the first time in my life. So like all these things before I turned 21 all happened kind of because of that Rose Bowl game. Did you know what you wanted to get into when you were, or do you have an idea of what you wanted to get into? I, I wanted to either be a sports writer okay. or a baseball coach um, or something like that. But I always got bad grades in school. Mm -hmm. And even at Santa Monica College, I had this history teacher who would not give me the C plus that I needed to transfer. And she's like, you will, you will get eaten alive at one of these UCs that you want to transfer to because you cannot write you can't do it. And I was like, but all these pretty girls love these little stories I write. I fold it up in the paper and I hand it. They're like, you could be scribbling anything. It's, it's, that's not what they're reacting to. They're reacting to you being nice to them and showing them attention. You cannot write. And so I cried in this library. I read uh, J.D. Salinger's uh, Nine Stories, Perfect Day for Banana Fish through my tears. And I was like, I can do what he is doing. And she was right. I look back at my older stuff and it, it was not good. You know how it is on Twitter when people just can't write. Okay. They think they can. Do you appreciate <laughs> her for saying that? A hundred percent. And I wish I remembered her name because I'm sure that that is so hard for a teacher like her to do. Here's this guy who's like just three units away and you, you can now let him go to the next step of his life. But I, I agree with her. I would have gotten eaten up at this next level and probably would have flunked out right away and had to start over. So, I mean, boo hoo, I had to take six months off, take my class over again. I also went to Europe for a month. <laughs> How'd you end up there? Well, I was selling these TVs at uh, this electronic <laughs> store and I was like one of the top salesmen. And so I was making good money for a 20 year old. And we, we had monthly bonuses. So if you even took two weeks off, you would never make the monthly bonus. So I said, well, can I just have the whole month off? And they're like, if you want, if you can afford it. So I turned 21 
in uh, Florence, Italy, alone, um, just a lone traveler. And uh, that was, I mean, I guess the kids today would call it like their gap year or whatever. And I highly recommend it. The things I learned there were great. My life lesson is if anything I've done has inspired you in any way, just know my family was not rich. I have never been well off. Uh, the things that I've done are simply because I wanted to and I saved up. So it was, it was, an, it was an amazing trip. And then afterwards, I, I went up to UC Santa Barbara, uh, did my, my real schooling up there. You think I prepared you? Like yes. gave you okay. Yes. Yes. Because you I think even if you are cocky, even if you're Michael Jordan and you know you can play basketball, mm -hmm. when you don't make your high school team, mm -hmm. <laughs> which they say Jordan didn't make his high school team, yeah. that makes you decide, all right, am I gonna fold or am I gonna come out hard? Yep. And so when I got to UC Santa Barbara, I was like, All right, I'm gonna I'm humble now. But I'm gonna beat your ass, and so I ended up um, writing for a newspaper of people who are still my friends today, and these people are still great writers. And it was so awesome to be surrounded by peers who could do things that you couldn't do yet, and um, and that kind of uh, communal growth is, I think, the greatest benefit of college. Everybody asks these days, "Is college worth it?" It costs so much. Is it worth it for this diploma? It is if you surround yourself with people who are smarter than you. Ah. Who are your age. Okay. Because they will lift you up. Okay. If if you're as competitive as I am. Okay. You know, you see this guy. So, like, uh, one of my buddies, uh, Pat Whalen, Jane's Addiction's Ritual to Habitual had just come out. And he wrote this long, epic review about it that was just way better than anything I could even imagine. And I was like, wow, he's just like me. Why can't I do that? And so, well, I guess I got to practice. And so, um, you know, our friends, I think, have been pushing each other ever since. So it's been great. So travel, kiss the girls of Italy, and... Um, get a chip on your shoulder. Get a little chip, be, but also be humble. I mean, you, you may not be as good as you think you are 1920. Um, you probably aren't. <laughs> <laughs> but the best way, the really the best way for me was feedback from either elders or in the newspaper, we got letters. And when people didn't like you, they would write a little letter. This is before email. Mm -hmm. But now what I love about Twitter and Facebook and all that are the comments. And so people like Kevin DeLeon who turn off their comments, the LAPD who turn off their comments, they're missing out because the, the honest feedback from the people is a big deal, I think. I mean, you can you can weed out the idiots from from the, the true critics, and I want to hear the people. So you'll never see me turn off my comments because um, I do want to hear from the people. I just want to curse them out. I want to hear your I comments, you and if you say something I don't like, you're gonna hear my mouth. I feel like I waste too much time doing that. I yeah, I, I still do that. I don't I, I don't find myself interacting much on Twitter. I I do a lot of posting, but not really. If you read my DMs, you'd understand why. Well, what I like about your Twitter account is because I follow you and everybody should follow Film the Police LA is anytime Karen Bass or Hugo tweet something, you got something to say. And so it it's from so my feed pulls up those interactions. So I appreciate you calling them out as much as you do. I wish I wish others would. Now we'll come back to that. Okay. I need to hear what happened after Santa Barbara. Oh, after Santa Barbara, um, I came back to L.A. and I worked for a, a TV manufacturing company, Philips Magnavox, and I was a sales trainer for them. My, my stupid experience selling TVs in junior college paid off, and now I was a, uh, a sales rep or training rep for Magnavox, Philips. And so I got to go to every – my assignment was to go to every mall or every – mom and pop shop that has Philips or Magnavox and teach them shit and hand out brochures and pens and all that. And so I was able to see all of Southern California like mm. this, all the way down mm. to the border. Um, we did events in Las Vegas for Consumer Electronics Show, and it just helped me um, speak in public well, um, be a representative for somebody. You know, like you got to be, you got to be 
it's different when you're representing somebody mm-hmm. other than yourself. Um, and then they pr- they promoted me to San Francisco because the internet was about to happen, mm-hmm. and they had a box that went on top of your TV and connected your TV to the internet. And back then, it was kind of hard to get on the internet, mm-hmm. and they made it really easy. So they're like, you are one of the few people who even knows what the internet is in our company, so we're going to move you up to San Francisco. So it was great to be in San Francisco during the, the initial boom of the internet, mm-hmm. And see San Francisco from 94 to 99. One of the jobs I did on the side after I was laid off was uh, sell beer at Candlestick Park for the Giants in 1997. And I got to see Barry Bonds every single day. Oh, wow. Which was the goal. There was Mark McGuire in Oakland. Yes. And there was Barry Bonds in San Francisco. And both teams had an ad in the newspaper. Another thing that's dating me. Kids, there used to be newspapers. And that's how you would get your jobs. And they both wanted workers and i was like even though i lived in san francisco it was easier to get to oakland stadium through bart it was only like five stops away boom 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 boom. you're there Mm. and so i was like either i can watch mcguire or i could watch barry bonds every day who do i want to see and i was like i think i want to see barry bonds every day Mm. because the 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 idea was he's an asshole and Mm -hmm. i was like i want to see if he really is an asshole was he an asshole (laughs) He definitely had a chip on his shoulder, to use your phrase. Okay. He definitely did. Um, he also provided wetsuits for his outfielders because it was cold as hell out there. So they put on wetsuits underneath their wow. uniforms. That's interesting. Do they? Mm-hmm. St- I mean, I'm sure they're using something different, but that sucks. That really sucks to play in that type of cold. You, you grew up in Chicago. I grew up in New York. You played Little League? Of course. I remember in those spring games, and you and you don't have a batting glove on. You have that aluminum bat, and you hit that ball, <laughs> and your hand is fucking stinging. It definitely is if you hit it at the end of the bat. Or if you're playing catcher, and you're catching it, and you, that's a lot of sting. So I can imagine in San Fran, that's pretty... It, you know what? That was the other thing was I wanted to see was Candlestick as horrible as everyone said it was. And for me, because I was moving around a lot, it wasn't. There was only a few nights where it was windy and cold. Um, usually it was one or the other. Um, but the fans were just sitting. So I can see why the fans would say it's cold. But we were hustling. for you know. But it was also really interesting watching every single home game. You know, you get, you can't, just like how you see these cops on the streets because you're out there every night, you see the subtleties, you see the the patterns and you see the changes of the patterns. And even stupid as me was able to see, oh, these Florida Marlins are a little bit better than everybody else. And they ended up winning the World Series. Mm. And so that's why I have criticism towards people like Bill Plaschke, uh, the LA Times columnist. Because he doesn't bring any of that expertise. And this is a guy who's been doing it for decades. Forever. And so if I could see it after 80 games, why can't Plaschke see it after 30 years? <laughs> I mean, maybe that's the problem. I don't think he's, he's paying attention, you know? So, so after San Francisco, I came back down here in 2000, and I never left. This okay. is L.A. is my home. And listen, I'm going to jump forward a little bit. Right? So one of my favorite things to do, and I do something similar, right? It's hard for me to drive past a mural or a, some artwork and not stop and take a picture of it. And yes. you do plenty of that. And especially with the work that you're doing now, yeah. you're all over the place. Yeah. And, I, you know, I feel that you get a chance to see. I think you really have to travel L.A., Mm-hmm. All throughout all the neighborhoods. Yes. To know what the neighborhoods are like, because each one is different. And right. on top of that, you have to do it frequently enough because they are changing year by year. That's right. Yeah. I mean, so so I pay for this podcast by driving Uber and Lyft. Mm-hmm. And um, I might be getting a full-time job sometime soon. Um, and I hope I do. 
But I think one of the advantages that I have over other people who try to cover LA is when your butt is in the seat and the guy goes, oh, we've got to go to 118th and Normandy, I'm excited because I'm not super familiar with that area. And I, I do want to see what it's like out there. I do want to see a church's chicken. I do want to see uh, this like weird ghetto ice cream shop that I've seen on TikTok. Because when you see it in person, it's so much different than when you see it on your phone. And, um, uh, I, I, and, and it's weird because I've pitched this idea to, to other places to say, you really need a dude who's just out there constantly moving, constantly bopping around. It's the only way. The city's way too big to just parachute in for a day or two because somebody got shot. Like, that is no way to cover L.A. And it's not like I'm trying to single-handedly cover all of L.A. That's impossible. But I bet you if you follow just our Instagram that you are going to see more aspects of L.A. than even the L.A. Times, which is ridiculous. Way more than the L.A. Times. Way more. Isn't that crazy, though? Way more. I think L.A. Times, I'm just going to jump in here. I think the L.A. Times does a terrible job of covering L.A. I don't, they do not have their ear to the ground, Mm -hmm. their ears to the ground. They are the types that seem to stop working at 5 p.m., you said 118th in Normandy. When was the last time a, a, a reporter from LA Times has been to 118th in Normandy? And that's actually closer to their El Segundo office than it is to my apartment right now. And the funny thing about it is, you know what? There's a story there because of course. within 15, 20 blocks of there, there's multiple inside state hotels that are roach infested and stuff. Yes. Send some LA Times uh, journalists out there to report on it, but they don't. Anyway, I'm sorry to cut you off. No, no, no. It, 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 it's... I love the LA Times. That was my dream since I was in college, maybe even before, to work there. And so to be able to have worked there and to have worked with all the people I got to work with was a a blessing and a dream. But it's also interesting when you're inside the machine to see the excuses why these things don't happen. They can do it. And and, and I think that's, that's another lesson that I want here in LA to be for people is it's just me and Jordan. That's it. I mean, everybody's support is fantastic in the ver- the variety of ways that we get support, even if it's just liking our posts or retweeting a tweet or being a guest. Those are all amazing forms of support. But <laughs> you multiply that by what the resources of the LA Times is, there should be five people at the LA Times doing what I do. There should definitely be one in South LA. There should be one in the Valley. And they should have just a couple others that then just like kind of live in a section, like for a month, just like live in Redondo Beach, you know, Uh, anything other than where the top 100 restaurants are of the LA Times, which is all between the 10 freeway and the Hollywood Hills and from downtown to the beach. Like you've worn out that part of LA. So, so branch out. If Bill Addison wants to review those restaurants there, fine, let him. But of of the young people that you want to let go, just assign them to areas of L.A. and just let them prove that they deserve to be at the L.A. Times. And they will. Well, tell me how you got to the L.A. Times from the time you, get, you came back in 2000. Yep. And I worked for a variety of different companies. And um, in 2001, I was working for E. And I hated E. It was a really, really hard job. I thought I would have loved it because it was my favorite channel at the time. Uh, They had Howard Stern. They had Joan Rivers telling people they looked bad. It was awesome. It was a a great channel. Uh, Brooke Burke. It was my favorite channel. But once you're in the machine again, Mm -hmm. it's different. And so I did not like the job and I was not getting paid very well. I was getting paid so little I couldn't even afford a car. Mm -hmm. So that's where my handle the bus blog came from because I had to ride the bus from here to mid city to go to work. And I learned something. There There we go. The origin story. (laughs) So I called it that, but I really rode the red line for most of it. And then I had to, the last little hall was, uh, what is that? The 702 or uh, whatever that Wilshire line is been a while and so I hated my job which was actually great it was liberating because I didn't care if I got fired so I so blogging had just started around this time 
And so during my 15 minute breaks, I would write a fictional story about who I was outside of this terrible world that I really was in. And I would just fictionalize and fantasize out loud in public. And it took off. This blog did wonders. And girls were sending me pictures and wanting to date me. A uh, couple flew out here. Like, it was nuts. I was like, I don't look like Tom Cruise. Like, and, and they're like, we know. But you're great. And I was like, I am? Because my friends, by the way, were getting bigger hits than me on Blogger and, and WordPress and stuff like that. So it was a beautiful thing. I ended up getting a job uh, being the editor of LAist. And this was when um, LAist was not even in the top 50 as far as page views goes in LA. Uh, the great Carolyn Kellogg was the editor at the time and she handed the torch over to me. She told her bosses that I should be the editor. I wouldn't be here without her. And they weren't really paying her. They're, I think they were paying her like 100 bucks, 200 bucks a month. She couldn't do that full time. So, she, so I said, I'll do it if, if they'll pay me full time money. And they did. They paid me full time money. And I was able to make LAist one of the, with, okay, me and the 35 people who worked for free sure. made LAist sure. a beast. And we were quadrupling the number one blog of the LA Times. You were way ahead of the game. Of the you know the industry wh where it was going because I imagine that you had a lot of the old school ones who probably had a lot of animosity and pushback and criticism and yeah. stuff. Tell me about that. Well, they did, but the greatest thing to me about the blogosphere was it was a street fight. Okay, and so the old fogies who were like, "Oh, they're doing it all wrong." It's like, okay, but we're playing street ball now. <laughs> So you can call a foul all you want and cry, but we're, we're still going to come hard on you. And so one of the things I was, I knew that they couldn't do and that the LA times couldn't do was post big giant pictures of marijuana buds and write about that, write about sex. We had a girl who, a woman, a young woman who started dating a guy who had a massive wiener. And she would tell me on the phone, just like, I love this guy. And I thought I wanted a massive wiener, but now that I have it, it's uncomfortable. I don't even want to have sex. And like, I was like, you have to write this down. You ha I can't be the only guy that gets to listen to this because this is an incredible story. So we changed her name, which I'm sure the LA Times wouldn't have done either. But again, these, this is just a blog. This, mm -hmm. just, this is different. The rules are different. So she wrote about that. Um, People reviewed weed, and, and one of the things that we did, we did some serious stuff. Like, we reviewed every single Thai restaurant in Thai town, one a day for 30 days, mm. which is another thing the LA Times could never do because mm. we knew that their rules were you got to go three times, you got to really? do it anonymously. Yeah, because they want to make sure that they just didn't get them on a bad night. They're, they're trying to be fair. Okay. <laughs> but that's, that's not just the LA Times. That's like... Yeah. Big big time journalism. That's, and that's the advantage you had. You had the nibbleness. We could we had nimble. We didn't have rules. Right. My only rule was do not bore the reader. Yeah. They're giving you their time. Honor their time. Be be good. So we went to every Thai restaurant, and then that was so good that I was like, let's go to every neighborhood. Oh. So the neighborhood project started. There we go. And um, it was great from the very beginning. And people responded in such a big way because, again, no other media outlet was honoring the neighborhoods. And so we just got so big that, that when the LA Times put out their most recent stats, beating their chest about how good their top blog was, we were, I was like, we're quadrupling them. Mm. So I wrote um, uh, the, the main woman of the online, Meredith Artley, who I adore, she ended up running CNN after the LA Times, CNN.com, the website. And I said, I don't know what the word is after quadruple, but I'm going to learn it unless you hire me. Mm. And I thought maybe they'd let me write kind of a blog about LA, but she put me in charge of all the blogs at the LA Times. And the first blogger we got was Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. He wanted to have a, have a blog. Unbelievable. Truly, truly. My, my childhood hero. I could only imagine the traffic that 
the blog was driving to the website versus just a columnist writing their wine track story. Well, one of the things I learned from LAist was my blog was decently popular. Not not top 1,000 or whatever, but decent. But LAist, because we were a team, exploded. And so I brought that to the LA Times. Mm -hmm. And I said, a columnist can never beat a team. Mm -hmm. Michael Jordan versus four scrubs mm -hmm. is still going to lose. Mm -hmm. You need a team. And so um, Kareem was the exception. Fine, Kareem, you can have your own blog. Okay. But our biggest blogs were our group blogs in sports and in local news and in entertainment. And it was hard to get these people who have been told their whole lives, you're the best writer in town. Some of them have Pulitzers. They are the best writers in town. But I said, it's kind of like Ghostbusters. You've got to merge the streams, cross the streams, and you will beat the ghost. And, and I said, our ghost is the New York Times. I'm tired of hearing that the New York Times is the best. I don't think they're that good in blogs. And I think you can beat them. And we ended up doing that. So working at the LA Times was great. I learned about the politics that you that that seemed to bother you, that stopped them from being as great as they can be. I also think the biggest problem with the LA Times is there's not another LA Times thing. I, I think competition absolutely is underrated. Let them compete. Let there be, so when there was the, the Herald Examiner or the Daily News, or even, believe it or not, when Huffington Post was good on, online, that would push people a little bit. And who is the peer of the LA Times today? It's nothing. There's nothing out there. And, and now that LAist is deciding to do whatever they're going to do, I don't even like to call it LAist anymore. It's, it's really KPCC. That's not LAist. That's not my baby over there. My baby's got an edge. I haven't seen an edge over there in a long time. These uh, TV news stations are okay for helicopter news, but, uh, you know, car chases and things like that. But there's nobody really pushing the LA Times about LA stuff. I, I, I do not envy uh, uh, Kevin, who is the editor-in-chief of the LA Times. I think this is a hard time to be the boss of that newspaper. And, and I, could, I could make it worse if I wanted to. I could put history in this stuff. I could do all the, the, the typical predictable bullshit things that uh, a newspaper's neighborhood coverage would be, but I'm not into that. I want to talk to people like you. <laughs> Fuck the history of Hollywood and the golden glamour age. Tell me about the brother who's yelling at the cops. <sighs> That's the story, right? I, I, I agree. <laughs> I agree. I, I Listen, I don't think, I think they're, I think the LA Times, and I've said this, the same thing you've been said. They don't have any competition. I'm from New York, right? Yeah. So you have the New York Times, right? Yep. Now, they are the badasses. We all know that. That's right. But they have competition in New yep. York, right? Even in, even the rags. Even the New York Post will push them here and there. That's right. You have even the Wall Street Journal. If you get away from the editorial page, mm -hmm. they do some pretty good reporting on politics and yeah. and stuff like that there's competition out here in, with la times there isn't anybody i think every la times reporter it's sort of like they get to once they reach they get that status of being an la times reporter oh then i've made it and i don't have to put any work in i don't have to go out there and dig and find stories i just kind of wait for stories to come to me and whatever my editor editors suggest and we just uh, you know put together our little boilerplate story and that's it. Nobody's actually out there digging, sticking their nose, you know, down on the ground, searching for things, getting uh, information that they should be digging for. You know, in New York, if a politician does something small, they will fucking eat you up. Out here, a, po a politician does something big. Uh, you know, a council member just got indicted the other day, and it was sort of a story for a day or so, and then business as usual. Well, I'm, I'm sorry that that's a perception that you've got because I know that it's not like that in that building. Uh, there's a guy named Paul Pringle who is an investigative reporter okay. who wrote a book last year called Bad City about some of the scandals at USC. And Paul Pringle's a bad ass. Mm -hmm. Like you and him in a wrestling match, I don't know who would win. And he's an older white dude. I would say most of the people there do do all the things that you want them to do. But 
I think that the end result, especially in City Hall, doesn't feel that way. Why is that? I don't know. I'm do not there. I do don't know. you sense that there that politics, city politics, extends into influence at the LA Times, possibly? No. Or it, do you feel that there is, uh, when it comes to the journalism, sort of access journalism with politicians and city council? I don't think so. Because um, in any other city, the politicians are the celebrity. And here they're not. And uh, so you don't have to kiss the ass of the politician here as you would anywhere else. And so I don't think they're worried too much about access. It does make me curious when people like Cerise are not hired by the LA Times, who clearly has the, the sheriff's department in a way that nobody else does. Why don't you hire somebody like that? And the person who was covering the sheriff before her is now moved over to work with Paul. In investigative stuff. So it seemed to me this was the perfect time to move Cerise over and promote her. And so maybe she's too punk rock. It, it would hurt me to think that because investigative reporting is punk rock. And so do you think the LA Times is this anti-punk rock? Because I can't think of who, who's a punk rock reporter over there. I will say the new person that covers the LASD for the, for the Times. The woman? She, uh, Carrie, she's good. Yeah. Uh, you know, she's formally incarcerated. Yep. Um, with the tattoos and that's punk it? rock, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I wish the person who covers the LAPD for the LA times. Is had that a James little... you're talking about? No, no, no. Uh, 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 James is actually decent. Um, who's this, this is, Oh, this is the brother, the black guy. Oh man. Don't get me started about him. man. <laughs> don't get me started about him. There is nobody. Yeah. That I think does a, a bigger disservice in this city, as far as journalists, than Libor and Johnny. Right. I think the issue is is when you get people covering a hard beat like that who don't have experience with that department. You're, or the city. Yeah. You're, you're, you're putting them in a bad spot. It's hard to learn by yourself in a new place with new contacts and and what what are the stories about covering the cops? It's got it's mostly the cops are bad. In a right? hundred different cities, neighborhoods, right. hundred different neighborhoods. And so right? how do you write the story that the cops were bad today when they delete information off oh. of their website, when they lie, when th their their leader retired, got a million bucks, then comes back? All these things, right? How do you where do you begin? <laughs> so I so it did not surprise me that he began slowly because he's new. If you would throw if you if you asked me to do this job in St. Louis, I wouldn't be able to hit the ground running. Oh, let me ask you a question. Hit the ground when it comes to hitting the ground running. Mm -hmm. His first couple weeks on the job, right? <laughs> you know me, I'm not going to hold any punches, right? <laughs> You're a baseball fan, so yeah. I think you would appreciate this uh -huh. line of questioning as far as priorities. Yeah. So, you know, I, I had been saying for a long time, the LAPD is going to shoot somebody. It, it's one thing when the LAPD shoots somebody, say, in the Valley. Yeah. Because it's just L.A. perceives the Valley different. Or if it happens in Northeast L.A. Yeah. But if you shoot a brother on in in South Central in a high pro or in Hollywood, mm -hmm. I had a feeling it was going to set things off, right? Mm -hmm. So if you have a shooting where a police shoot somebody in the back who's unarmed, a veteran who served in the Air Force as a medic during the Gulf War or during uh, after nine eleven. Mm -hmm. And the person that shot him shot him out of a car while one hand on the steering wheel shot him out of the window in the back. The other person that shot him in the back was told by his partner he does not have a gun. But yet he shot him in the back. And oh, by the way, that's the number two at the police union's son, right? Yep. When that shooting happens and it happens at 8 o'clock at night and you're on the job for a few weeks... Don't you think it's kind of important for you to get to that scene and talk to the PIO? Sure. 
All right. So I'm thinking, you know, it's a hard beat, right? But I was there. Mm -hmm. And I know that uh, Sean Cat Mitchell was there. A cat with news. A cat with news. Mm -hmm. He was there. And he was there until one or two o'clock in the morning. And both of you guys are doing this in your free time. Yeah. You already have real jobs. Exactly. This, yeah, this is not my job. Mm -hmm. I heard the news and I made my way over there because I said, you know what? Something's not right. Mm -hmm. You can, you, When the LAPD puts out a tweet about a shooting, if you look at the language they use, you can kind of tell if something's not right. Yeah. But we were over there. We were over there at 1 or 2 o'clock in the morning. And you want to know something? I went back the next day so I can walk the neighborhood and try to find out talk to neighbors and <clears throat> find out some information. You know who I saw when, when I was there? Who's that? I saw Sean Cat Mitchell there. Mm-hmm. Well, Car 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 Mitchell. <laughs> I always call him Cat because of his, his uh I prefer Twitter it when, you, when people call them their, their Twitter name. Yeah, I know. I just, it's just, I, he, first off, he's got a dope logo. <laughs> he does. I, I love it. But he was there the next day yep. interviewing. Where was Libor? You know where Libor was? Where was he? He was at Dodger Stadium in the Upper Deck interviewing people about their experiences at Dodger Stadium for the All-Star game. Mm. Well, this we, is, his job is the LAPD beat. But we can't blame him for that one because he was clearly sent there. He, but he wasn't. He didn't write a story on that. Oh, he, he didn't? No. He posted on his Twitter. Oh. He wasn't sent there. So to, that was his day off or something? Yeah. Oh. Um, so, you know, he, he got the job. He, he was the guy who, in Minnesota... Uh, got his hands on the George Floyd t the video. Oh, is that how he got this? And he won a Pulitzer from it. And everything I heard from the people in Minnesota who yeah. reached out to me said, this guy is the laziest person. He does no work. Oh. All he does is take the LAPD press releases and sort of puts it in his template right. and repeats it. And I have noticed the same thing. I have never seen him at a police shooting scene. I show up to these things. Mm -hmm. I've never seen him there once. I have, I when, when the LAPD releases a bullshit statement or they release a video where I'm like, okay, they just last week, they released a video shooting at somebody who didn't have a gun. I'm asking the questions. Why aren't you? So that's my rant about Libor. I, well, and, and why isn't Sean covering the LAPD for the LA times? Mm -hmm. And I remember you telling me in the past that you should have guys out there with cameras going around filming stuff, right? There's, there's a lot of value in that, not just, writing the print mm -hmm. but actually giving the context with some video and integrating them in an article why doesn't the la times start adopting that model that was your idea to me two years ago mm -hmm. and that was way ahead of the game it's going to end up there mm -hmm. they're not going to end up there anytime soon well i mean the, the they need to hire you back i don't think they'll ever do it pride no i, I I am. I don't fit that mold. Not everybody fits the the thing, you know. <sighs> not everybody. I'll put it this way: not everybody's a San Diego Charger, and not everybody's a Raider. I'm I'm definitely a Raider. But it's a but it's about vision, though, right? It's it's looking at where journalism is going, mm -hmm. not just now, but in the future. And you caught on. You you know you you. I was going to say rode the wave, but yeah. you helped create that wave. At, with your blogging, you have this vision. Why is why are you able to see this in the LA Times is unable to see it or will be unwilling to adapt to that or accept that? It's a, it's a corporation. It's a corporate thing. I mean, maybe it's not technically a corporation because a billionaire who owns it. But um, I I'm not good at telling vice presidents and stuff. <laughs> this is fucked up. I did my best. Our numbers were fantastic i think blogs accounted for like 40 to 45 percent of the traffic when they let me go so what's the problem i was never told what the problem was i to be honest though i think the problem was they never wanted blogs they never loved blogs they didn't never understood them and when the woman who hired me had moved on there was nobody to protect me and so when i was when i was let go Blogs disappeared very quickly from that website, very, very quickly, which tells me their, their love wasn't there, you know? And so, which is, which is all fine and dandy. But numbers are numbers. If traffic is being driven there, then traffic is being driven there. Yeah. And to walk away from that, how does that help the LA Times? Usually the scoreboard will save you. 
Right. But sometimes it doesn't. And sometimes they think, well, we could do that. What was so special about him? We could do that. We can automate it. We could do this. We do that. We learned a lot from him in three and a half years. We could do it. Well, part of doing it is don't kill the blocks. You know, broken links to me are ridiculous because there's a thing called the long tail. Mm -hmm. So you could put up a story this year, but it might have a, an extra spike a couple years later when news cycles back and that person turns out to be this person. And so there's just, there's all this work that you do that when you kill it, you don't get any of the bounty from, from that. And you really do need a champion. You know, and so, I mean, there are days where I really miss being there a lot, in part because the people are fantastic, totally fantastic people over there. But I love that I can do whatever I want. I just love that I could do whatever. Today, you're like, yeah, you want to do it today? Okay, fine. Uh, who cares? Right? I don't have to worry about hits on this thing. I don't have to worry about, I mean, I can say fuck on Twitter. Mm. I can't do any of that stuff. Mm -hmm. And again, this is playing street ball. Mm -hmm. I, I feel much more comfortable playing street mm -hmm. ball than trying to fake playing four corners offense. I am not the Princeton coach of basketball. I, I am different. Mm -hmm. And I, what I want to tell people in the world is own your differencenessness mm -hmm. because that's the thing that is, uh, is going to get people to love you better than the, the guy who's faking it. So we don't, we, we have criticisms with these reporters because it doesn't feel like they're giving 100%. Mm -hmm. I feel like when people don't give 100%, it's because their heart isn't into the gig. Mm -hmm. And so why isn't their heart into the gig? Because they don't see ownership of themselves, they don't see themselves in the stories, whatever. So my thing is, is that I love doing this because nobody gets to tell me what to do. Mm -hmm. I get to cover whoever I want. Mm -hmm. You text me and you say, I want you to talk to Richie. And suddenly I've got the head of Antifa LA <laughs> on the mic. How great was that? I love that guy. Wasn't that great? Yeah. He's one of the real ones. There's not many real ones out here. He's one of the real ones. And some people will try to criticize him. They can criticize him. You know what they're doing? They criticize him from the couch while he's out there doing it. <laughs> and there's things to... I, I mean, everybody's got... Even when... I used to do this a little bit with you. I'd be like, you should have said this. You should have said that. But, but again, we're, we're, we're backseat quarterback, Sunday mor Monday morning quarterbacking. And it's like, but he's right. You know, the, the, and sometimes it's not the words. It's the vibe. Mm -hmm. You know, you have made a difference in Hollywood. The cops are better because of you. And I think City Hall is always worried about Richie and his crew. And I think that's good. You shouldn't, you should be looking over your shoulder mm -hmm. if you're up to nonsense. And, and so maybe the words aren't exactly how we would script them if we were sober on Wednesday morning for the Thursday encounter. But so what? It, they understand where you're coming from. I think that he and his crew sort of shaped some of the narrative of the 2022 election. Yes. I think his crew, listen, there is a reason why Kenneth Mejia yep. got more votes than Karen Bass, but got more votes than any official That's in right. LA, LA history. Yep. Okay? That's not happening without Arici and people around him out there That's right. doing what they're doing. So I think, people, like, again, people can criticize all they want, you know? Uh, here, I'll bring it up. Some, you know, some of these organizations. Mm-hmm. A year and a half ago, maybe what was it? No, two years ago, wrote a letter condemning Ricci. Which organization? Well, most of them. <laughs> most of these bullshit, like you know, like, like give me an example. Oh, of one. Ground Game LA. Okay. And in these DSA assholes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, those those types. You know, they were like which which they were upset because they were trying to blame him for Echo Park. Shut the fuck up. How is he? In he didn't have a, he didn't. <laughs> One dude. Uh, I mean, listen, you know. Okay, but this is the, where it hurts The cops me. had a hard time at Echo Park yeah. and they were wearing sunglasses. <laughs> and I'm going to tell you right now. 
Uh-huh. The cops blast me in their face all the time with those fucking bright ass lights. They did in front of my house a few weeks ago, yep. right in front of my house. Yep. You're not going to get any sympathy from me. Hey, okay. So when the police flash their flashlight at your camera or anybody's camera, mm-hmm. technically that's an infringement on the first amendment. <laughs> Just an infringement on because, the first. because we have the right to film the police. We have more than the, yeah. So it, listen, we hear first amendment. I had to explain this to a sergeant one time. Mm-hmm. Because he was using his light on me, and I said, you know, that's a First Amendment violation. He's like, how? How? How am I stopping you from speaking? I said, well, let me explain it to you. So the First Amendment is more than just the ability of freedom of speech. Yep. It's also about the ability for, for myself or anybody else to gather information that we can then disseminate to the public, right? So capturing, videotaping an incident in public and if you interfere with that, you are interfering with my First Amendment right. Yes. Or if you do anything to interfere with my ability to disseminate that information. So they love playing music these days, right. thinking it's going to trigger. Are they still playing music? No, nah, because honestly, you don't, you don't really get dinged for that, for copyright violations. Mm-hmm. I guess maybe if you're doing live streams. Right. I don't live stream. Yeah. I, it's, if I live stream, it's because I'm within three or four blocks of my house. Yeah. I don't really want to be in a, some fucked up, some area away from my house. Live stream, let everybody know where I'm at right there at two o'clock in the morning. So let me ask you about the First Amendment thing. Yeah. Has any cop ever gotten uh, in trouble for, for flashing the light on somebody who's trying to film out in the streets? Yeah. I got oh, a, they have? Oh, yeah, man. I, I got, I got well, You've gotten some sustains? Oh, I've gotten, I got, got Perio a four-day suspension. For that? Yeah. Well, congratulations. Uh, uh, that's what, I was mad at LA Taco because they tried to take my fucking credit. They tried to take credit for that damn complaint. Not right. against Lex. It wasn't Lex. And it wasn't. Right. And it, 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 it's strictly Javier, you bitch. Ooh. Uh, uh, he blocked me and I'm not even calling him a bitch. Uh, listen, I told, I told, I, I saw Lex one day and I told him, I said, you know, me and you are cool, whatever. That's right. But for Javier, it's until the end of fucking time. I feel bad for Lexus. Lexus is a good reporter. He's a great reporter. We should honor him. And uh, listen, he, he does things differently than he is on the ground, right? Yes, he is. He will be, you know, out in the neighborhoods. You know, he loves, you know, in yeah. Koreatown or wherever and doing his reporting. You know, mm-hmm. that's how it should be. Yeah. Uh, I think I think Javier is a bitch, though. And I think, he, you know, Lex deserves better than him. Totally agree. Oh, there we go. <laughs> It's indisputable, Javier. So here's the crazy thing about Lex. He would fit at the LA Times better than I would ever fit because he's a soft-spoken, polite gentleman. People, I aspire to be that. I'm not that. Lex is the biggest. He is so tall. He's like seven foot eight, right? He's huge, right? Seven foot eight. And he's got to be the nicest person sweet. yes the sweet person yes yeah he would do i mean uh, he's not going to be the type of person that's going to go in there and just like curse everybody no. out and cause he's no. if you have a problem with lex right right if you're the type of person that just like wants to pick a fight with him then mm-hmm. something's kind of wrong with you something's wrong uh, yeah. the cops love doing it with, though with him they love they do off. they oh, mess yeah. with him yeah all the time the the suspension that we got for prio for using the light was yeah. because i i oh, tr- that was then yeah I remember that. Yeah, I've been trying to get this guy's name. He'd been harassing me for like a year, a year and a half. And the way that the, when you work night shift, right, it's impossible to read their name tags. Right. Unless you're two feet away. Yeah. They design them that way. And so I've been trying to get his name. He refused me to give his name for the longest time. And I went to my assistant. I said, creep over there and see if you can get close. And he saw her coming. And so he started using his light on her camera. And then he walked away laughing and he said to Lex, you want some of that too? And did it to Lex's camera. And so then I wanted his name and he was being a jerk. Right. And I fucking went off on him for like 20 minutes. They definitely get in trouble when they don't give their name. They Hold definitely on. do on not. Hey, Alexa, turn off the plug. She won't do it. Alexa, Pause. There we go. These robots. Let's talk about robots. Oh, absolutely. You were saying that. Are you are you softening to the robots? You 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 pretend that you hate them. Do you really hate them? These are the delivery robots that scoot around Hollywood with food in them, I hope, right? Yeah, unless they get cracked open and 
Have you seen them get cracked open? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, They're vulnerable out there, aren't they? Well, I mean, listen, they lock as soon as they are... As soon as the food is put in them. Okay. But so do you really hate them as much as you seem to, or is it just a fun little jab? At- a little bit of both. <laughs> I mean, listen, they're not a little bit of creepy. Come on now. They're very creepy. And the automation of it, which at the end of the day, it, somebody's losing their job. Okay. I heard that there's dudes in China using satellites no. that can see this thing crossing the street. So, do you think that's possible? No, they're sitting over there. It's just GPS. Send me the. No, no, it's a combination. So when they're, from my understanding, uh-huh. when they're on the sidewalks, it's it's AI and uh-huh. it's navigating itself. Unless it, it, an obstacle, right, comes in its course, and then when it goes to an intersection, then a human takes control. Well, of so it. there is a guy in China. A guy in West Hollywood, but yeah. Oh, you think so? Oh, I know so. In America, you know so. Behind, I, I could tell you the street. It's on Formosa <gasps> and uh, Formosa. What would that be? Formosa and Willoughby. It, right across the street from the Oprah Building. Oh yeah, by the by the right Formosa. Next to the, there's a DMV right there. There's a small. Oh yeah. Two buildings down. That's where they are. That's where they keep them at, and that's where they. Okay, come LA out. Times. We need a, a feature. I have on a whole people. story about them with that because I filmed them going in there. Because one night I was just walking over there, I was, and I'm like, "What the fuck are three of you doing over here? What the fuck is this? <laughs> what are you up to?" Right? And I had a narrative going that they were delivering drugs. They were drug dealers. <laughs> it would be good. I mean, it's that. smart, right? It's, and they're driving up the street, and all of a sudden the gate opens, and they stop, and they start going in there. I'm like, "Wait, what the fuck are you?" These are the robots you're talking to or the people? The I'm talking to the robots. So the robots all... I was talking to Shelby. <laughs> I was talking to Damien. I was talking to... Uh, I think Damien got, in, uh, got stuck the other day. Where at? I think you were filming Damien getting stuck the other day. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I've listened. I filmed some good shit, man. I filmed I filmed <laughs> one of them getting attacked, cracked open. He was flipped over on his side. Austin. And the guy was telling me why he did it. And he, he was saying, you know, it says serve robots. on the, It says serve robotics. But he's like, fuck robots. He took that as like serve robots. Hey, you humans serve robots. And he was offended. So he knocked it over and... And broke it. Yeah. I mean, he did have the food in his hand, you know, in a oh. full, uh, empty container of food. Oh. But, uh. <laughs> okay. Let's... People love those robots. I don't, I'll be honest with you. I don't quite get it. I just talk shit to them. I just film it. Good. I don't think it's that funny. People think it's funny. Yeah. I made it a TikTok. It is tic- funny. I made a TikTok account about it and the <laughs> fucking thing. I, it's, you know what? I made a TikTok account. And it had like. 200,000 followers in like a month. Did you really? Yeah, but all my other accounts for Film the Police all these years mm-hmm. don't even add up to half of that. Isn't that crazy? That's insulting. So are you going to flip it and, and turn that into your Film the Police uh, TikTok then? No, I mean, I have, I have, uh, you know, my, my Film the Police TikTok is pretty good. So it's got okay. like 68,000, but that's really good. But the, the robot thing's like 300,000, and I just post bullshit. Let me ask you about the Film the Police YouTube channel. Because yeah. that seems like that takes a lot of time. No time. I, haven't put, I put no effort into it so far. So it's not a big deal for you to, to put up videos over there? I put no effort. I'll be honest with you. I put no do, So Do you get good responses from those videos? Yeah. I mean, so listen, I, 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 I could have a couple hundred thousand followers right now. Mm-hmm. What I did is uh, maybe a year and a half ago, I, t- I was just testing it out. I, I went hard at it for two months. I just wanted to see how well it would grow and tr- just tried out different things. Yeah. And I took a pause on that because I'm working on other things. I'm sort of integrating a lot of things together right now. Good. And so that's going to be a very useful tool, tool going forward mm-hmm. with what I'm doing. Um, cause I have a huge, I have a plan. I'm going to beat the fuck out of LAPD over the next couple of months. I have a plan on doing it. They don't know it's coming. They know some of it, but they don't know all of it. Uh-huh. But I understand at the end of the day, it's really about me handling my own press. Yeah. I don't need, I, I actually, I don't need the LA times. Well, you know, a lot of influencers have proven they don't need the media. Oh, I listen, I'm going to tell you something, right? When, when I look at the media, I look at what you're doing right here, mm-hmm. right? As we sit here with two microphones in your living room, right? That's it. Right. And it was at 730 at night. 
I'm wearing my sweats and, you know, you got your cub stuff on a t-shirt, you know, you're not yeah. someplace with a jacket on and, nope. and, and having makeup and all other shit. Right. But I, I used to, you know, I watched some ESPN stuff in the past. Right. Mm -hmm. And I look at guys like, uh, you know, like Marcellus Wiley, mm -hmm. I look at a guy like Shannon Sharp and these types yeah. and they're at ESPN and they're getting ratings of like 200,000 viewers or whatever. That's right. And they took ownership of their own shit. And they left there instead of having to be at a studio at a certain time to talk about whatever they have to talk about. It's not yeah. what they want to talk about. That's right. They can't curse. They can't just, you know, they have to be concerned about the the advertisers. Sure. And you know what? They're probably taking a position that maybe it's not even their position. They're told that they have to be that because they have to have right. that conflict. Yep. But now they're at home in their own living rooms doing the same sort of things. And you know what they're getting? They're getting 100,000, 200,000 viewers. Right. right. And all that money's going into their pocket because ESPN owned all of that before, even owned their social media accounts. Now they own it. They own, they have full control of their, of what they're going to talk about. They can curse. They can talk like how you and I are talking, like yeah. two friends talking. You know, when we watch a baseball game, right? Nobody's talking about a baseball game the way like Skip Bayless and them are talking about a baseball game. They're talking like regular people of friends together talking. That's right. And, this is where the media is going. Mm -hmm. I think this is where, I mean, you already see it now. All these guys, Stephen A. Smith, they're all migrating to podcasts and mm -hmm. YouTube. So I think, right, again, you're way ahead of where things are going. It's the grind, though. It is a grind. and uh, But the good news is, is I, even when I was selling TVs on commission, I wanted to make more than the other guy that I was better than. Yeah, yeah. And I think influencers, uh, people like you, you should have better rewards than the people who aren't out there at one in the morning at the crime scene. You know, you, you do deserve that stuff. And so it's only fair um, that the rewards go to the people who are actually hustling, truly hustling. And, and again, no disrespect to my friends in the media because a lot of times it's not on them. If they get assigned to something else because an editor wants them there, what are they going to say? No, they've got it. They got to do what they got to do. I mean, that's part of the deal of working for somebody else is you got to do what that guy wants you to do. But I think you're absolutely right. They used to try to diminish it by calling it citizen journalism, um, amateur journalism, whatever they wanted to say. And even these cops, they're like, well, freedom of the press. Are you the press? Like they try to they try to be smart. And one thing you've taught me is these cops don't know as much about the law as we always thought they did. Um, maybe you never thought they did, but I assumed that they knew about the law, but they don't. I was always shocked by it. I'm to the, uh, it, every day it gets worse. It doesn't get better. Last time we talked to you was two years ago, so maybe this is going to be a two-hour show just like Richie's. Let's go down the list. Mm -hmm. Michael Moore. Where does he stand right now with the cops? Where does he stand with the mayor? Is he in, is he in trouble? No, he's in absolutely no trouble. He is more blatant than ever with, with his, I'm going to say, corruption. Mm -hmm. It's right now from... My perspective with what I do, mm -hmm. it's worse than ever. Under Karen Bass, it is worse than it had been. Give me an example of something that he didn't do under Garcetti that he's doing under Bass. Well, I mean, listen, I'll give you an example today, right? Um, I received a complaint disposition letter. Uh, it was a shooting in Lemur Park. Cops did drive by, shot the guy in the back. Um, two cops shot him in the back. The police said that he had a weapon. When I was on scene that night, said he had a weapon. And I asked the PIO, what was the weapon? He said, is it a knife, a gun? He's like, it was a weapon. Well, what is a weapon? Tell me what it is. He's like, well, I haven't had a chance to look at it. Well, go walk down the street. <laughs> it's 100 feet down there. Go walk over there. Go look at what it is. Come back and tell us. You're sitting there telling me and Channel 4 News that it's a weapon. Come to find out it wasn't. It was a car lock. Right. right? And they were just fucking lying. Yeah. Um, is that PIO? Because I remember that incident. Is that PIO still a PIO? Yeah, I see him all the time. Crazy. What yeah, was no. his name? Oh, uh, Bruce something. 
He was a black guy, right? No, nah, he's uh, I would Asian say guy, Pacific Islander. There you go. I do. Uh, you know, really good looking guy, well dressed. Yeah. You know, he looks the part. But it is it is odd to talk about something you don't have the facts about. Well, that's what they do. And you're the official fact giver. What they do is not in the pu- public interest. It's not in the public interest. Yeah. It's an LAPD interest. Right. Michael Moore sent me a letter today. I, I received a video of immediately after that shooting. Before, when that guy was laying on the ground, they still had guns pointed at him. They, ha- they handcuffed him and all that. Then that item on the ground... The car latch actuator, they're calling it. Yeah. Which at one time they called a non-functioning firearm. That was great. Which technically, <laughs> you know what a non-function, anything could be a non-functioning firearm. A pen on a table could be a non-functioning firearm. The only thing that could not be a non-functioning firearm is a functioning firearm. <laughs> but anyway, I but saw. Doesn't, doesn't a, a firearm of any sort have to fire something? Yes. yes. Could this thing have fired anything? No, it was a car lock. Right. It was a piece of metal. It was like a square piece of metal. It was, yeah. But I received video showing an officer going over to that item and picking it up and wandering around the car- crime scene with it before he looked around and threw it on a t- roof on the hood of a car oh. to where the, sh- the shooter came over and said where is the item at which he had no business looking at he's supposed to be after you shoot he's supposed to be isolated into the side but he came over to look at and he didn't call it a weapon he called it an item the, the, the you're, you're talking about the police officer who did the shooting who actually shot this this suspect. came over and looked at it another officer moved it mm. then threw it on top of a car right. but then the shooter came looking for it and they were trying to you're not supposed to move evidence when it's on the ground mm-hmm. period 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 yeah I supplied Michael Moore with the video of that. I received a disposition letter today saying that no item was moved. Listen, the video shows it. Okay. But that didn't. That they said it didn't happen. I received a disposition letter yesterday of an incident where a guy was handcuffed on the ground with his legs shackled and a cop came over and stepped on his face. Clear as day. The video is clear as can be. Yep. And the Office of Constitutional Policing told me that the looking at the body cam video, the foot did not make contact with the man's face. Have they made the body cam video public? No. I don't need the body cam video. I have the video of well, the incident. Well, I, I w- if they've got a different angle, I want to see the angle, don't you? Well, they would have a closer angle, right, but they're not going to release it. Then they said the victim on the ground never claimed that the cops stepped on his face. Mm-hmm. But I have video from across the street. 17 seconds afterwards, he said, why'd you step on my face like that? Oh. So if the video across the street was able to pick it up, but yeah. the body cam video at the scene of multiple officers didn't, so they lie like that. So right. this is where things are with Michael Moore. With Michael Moore right now, no matter the complaint, it is going to be thrown out. You asked me a few minutes ago about... Uh, you know, lights and cameras, and is it a First Amendment violation? I have sustained a couple of a, a couple of those. Mm-hmm. Others I haven't. Mm-hmm. You asked me about officers refusing to ID. It's mm-hmm. clear as can be. They have to ID. Right. Ninety percent of those are never sustained. What's the what's what's the reasoning behind that? The reasoning behind that is I will then immediately ask Michael Moore, Michael Moore, why wasn't this sustained? And then he won't answer, and I'll send him two more emails, and then he'll say, we screwed up. Yes, it should have been sustained. Or internal affairs will say, we screwed up. It should have been sustained. So I say, okay, you're going to go back and correct this? And they say, no, it's past the statute, so we can't do anything about it. This is complaint after complaint after Mm -hmm. complaint right now. I went through a streak last year. I probably sustained, I don't know, 70 complaints or whatever. Wow. Now we've reached over the last few months where they refuse to sustain anything. I think they're worried that they're facing potential lawsuits. I think they're worried that La- lawsuits from who? From from the actual victims? No, whose think, faces got stepped so, on? No, so I think it, it goes. It's 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 complex. Uh-huh. They're worried about a lawsuit from their own officers about the picture release. Right. Okay. Hold, hold on. Let's let's refresh everybody's minds about that. Sure. Uh, this reporter 
A Latino reporter? Yes. For do you know from where? Ben Camacho. He writes. I, I think he's pretty much a photojournalist, but he does some work with Knock. From Knock LA, right. right. Which is where Cerise uh, does most of her work. He asked for all the pictures and names of the LAPD. Correct. Which is punk rock. <laughs> because this database never existed before outside of the, the walls of the police department. And the police department gave it to him. And when he posted it, this is, this is my, my version of it. Mm-hmm. Please correct me. Mm-hmm. Once he posted it, another website of maybe their heart isn't in the right place kind of wanted to use that information to dox these, these no. cops and do bad things. No, no. Okay, good. Good. But anyways, it got out there and it ended up on multiple websites, not just on Knock. And one of the things that third parties were able to do is now if you can get a badge number or serial number of a, of a officer, I think through Twitter, it'll automatically tell you who this person is and give the salary and all the, the public information. Mm-hmm. So what part did I get wrong? All right. So first off, all right. It's, so it started off with Ben Camacho. He, uh, he has CPR aid asked for a roster and the pictures and the city attorney refused. And oh. so he went and got a lawyer to uh-huh. sue. Uh-huh. And the city attorney settled. They said, okay, fine. We'll turn it over. Here, we're, but we're, we're not going to give you anybody who would, is in sort of a sensitive assignment. Right. Uh, undercover or whatever. Yeah. First off, there are no undercover officers in the LAPD. We'll, we'll, we'll return to that in a second. Uh, we will. Um, they even wrote in paperwork that there are no undercover officers included. Okay. They released the pictures to him back in, I think it was October. Mm-hmm. Ben then gave uh, the pictures to the uh, Stop LAPD Spying Coalition. Okay. Who put together a website which lists the officers, you know, the basic information, their uh, rank, their name, their division that they're in, their sex, um, basic salary information, which is on Transparent California. My girlfriend works for the city of Calif- for the state of California. Her information is on there too. It's public information. Okay. They put that database on there. Um, out of nowhere, uh, about twenty cops you know, for the for, that are connected to the union started hollering that they put them at risk. We are undercover officers, and we do not want anybody knowing that we are cops. If they know that we are cops, it puts us at risk, blah, 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 blah. Which sounds reasonable. If you were to, undercover. Well, to, to, to Joe Sixpack, who's living down the road, that seems like a reasonable thing from the cops saying, don't out us. We're undercover. Well, we're, we're not. We're, okay. If we're doing drug deals, if pretending to be right. druggies, whatever it is. But they don't do that. So, but, but this is why people love you. You and your kind, you people, quote mm-hmm. unquote, because you people showed up and said, well, if you're so undercover, mm-hmm. why do you do X, Y, and Z? What were some of the examples well, that these uh, well, so-called well, undercover cops were doing? Well, let me kind of tell you how much, before we get to that, right? Okay. Because it started with these 20 cops and they're, they were claiming that they were undercover. The, the special investigation section of the LAPD. Right? Which is SIS. Which is the SIS, right? So they're the most notorious unit. They're considered potentially, possibly the most elite tactical force in America. Oh. Oh, yeah. I mean, they they themselves feel that they are so elite that they do not even care for training with people in the United States anymore. So they go and train over in Ireland with their police forces, oh. which is interesting. <laughs> and then they also train, f- in, I, you know, we dug up some information, found that they've been training over in Israel with the Israeli forces. Okay. Uh, paid for by one Rick Caruso, where he paid 50% of the bill to send him over Did there. he really? Yeah. Wow. About 10 years ago. Okay. When he was on the police commission? I think this might have either on the commission or even after he left because he was still donating money here and there. Right. Like, um, so they started hollering and said, well, we are undercover officers and we are going to sue. 
Yeah. Because that's what the LAPD officers do. They sue, right? That's what the LAPD union is all about. They're all about suing. Yeah. Um, if you look at... Uh, well, it's free money. Usually the LAPD loses. Well, they settle. Right. They always settle. And they always settle it's not their cops. money. It's easy to settle. That, the cops are always looking for ways to sue. Jamie McBride, I think he won $15 million. Mm -hmm. You know, that's how he got to uh, be the LAPPL director was because he was so effective at suing. It's all, that's what they're all about. So they saw a way as, oh, getting easy money. He said, we are going to sue on behalf of the SIS because they outed us. Right. And then from there, they said, oh, no, actually, it's more like 100. And then they said, oh, it's 300. So now they're saying any detective should not have been outed or anybody who wants to be an undercover or a detective in the oh, future. Interesting. So what we said was, okay, you know what? You guys are saying, because they actually put in the sworn declarations that were included in this lawsuit, some of it which were accidentally put in there because Heidi uh, Felsin Soto is such a fucking moron. This is the city attorney? Which is the city attorney, mm -hmm. the, the ultimate dumb fuck. She is so fucking stupid. She is literally the dumbest person. It, if you read some of her, these, what she wrote in here, her, her rationale, it's literally, I want to print it out and carry it around in my wallet <laughs> because it's so fucking fascinating for its stupidity. Mm -hmm. But anyway, uh, she decided that she was going to sue to get the pictures back. Which is stupid. Which is, come on. So the pictures are out there and they're out there in the public, right? right? And she's trying to make the case. Do you think that she was doing this for symbolic reasons? or She do you was think, doing it because... you think she, she really believed that they would come back and never see the light of day again? I think again? she's... I, no, she, she, she was on a kamikaze mission for the LAPPL. This is all about the LAPPL trying to work the refs. Right, because they're going to yeah. sue on behalf of three hundred cops. Well, but but I don't even consider the city attorney the ref. But they are. But they would never they would never charge the cops. But here's you've the got thing. a murder. But people. they are essential when it comes to to suing, right? Yes. The LAPPL is going to sue on behalf of three hundred cops and say that their lives have been put at risk by this picture release. Yes. And who is going to make the determination of whether they're going to take it to trial or or settle? It's going to be the city attorney. That's right. And so they've already worked her. If she were to go against their uh, uh, their lawsuit and not offer a settlement, she'd look like a hypocrite because she was the one in her own brief saying that they are at risk, that their lives are at risk, that they operate from you know uh, anonymity right. and that any sort of information to even know that they're a cop is going to put them at risk. So what we did is we said, okay, you know, let's take a look at these SIS, right? Let's see, are these cops, are they hiding their identity? And what we found is the SIS are the biggest fucking attention whores in all of the LAPD. So the first thing we did is we Googled SIS. And the first thing that started popping up were these motherfuckers' LinkedIn's. They were putting in their LinkedIn that their SIS. Now, imagine if you were an undercover agent for the CIA and you were putting in your LinkedIn, I'm an undercover agent for the CIA. This is the equivalent. Okay. But you didn't just Google SIS. No. You, no. Did, you said SIS LAPD maybe? Or SIS Frank Johnson? Oh, no. no. We, we, we typed in special investigation section. Los Angeles, something no, like that. just that. That's it? Yeah. Or you could type in, you could type in SIS LAPD. And so their LinkedIn's were popping up. Yeah. Right? And so then we said, oh, fuck. Yeah, at first we saw that and we started laughing. You're like, oh, really? You guys, who, can you imagine an undercover agent putting them their, that in their LinkedIn? It wouldn't even work in a movie because no audience is going to say, cops aren't that stupid. Well, then we found out they're way stupider than that, right? So then we go in there and we're like, okay, let's, before we blow this up, let's just do a little searching around. So we go in their LinkedIn and people also viewed on the bottom of LinkedIn. And so we look, I'm like, holy shit. And so we started seeing all these guys at uh, SIS. So then what we did is we figured out who the members of the SIS were. Mm -hmm. um, I think they figured out how we figured it out. Mm -hmm. did, you, what, did, you, did you scan through their friends? No. I, I, well, to figure out, we had to do two things, right? So we had to figure out from using LAPD information, mm -hmm. who the exact officers are. Mm -hmm. And then we wanted to make sure, research each one of them up to see what information they put on the internet. Right. 
I think uh, all but two did we find extensive information. Extensive, right? So if an average cop on the street, I look them up. It's right. hard, it's, I might find their address where they live. That's it. There won't be a, 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 a Twitter account. There won't be a Facebook. There won't yeah. be an Instagram. They're hard, the younger cops. They know the, they, know they don't have they don't have much of a footprint. The SIS. See these guys, right? They work what they call undercover, and they feel like they're doing all this hard work and they get no glory. So they all work as like consultants for movies on the side. What glory are they looking for? They are, they listen. They have, they a bunch of them have IMDb pages. Okay, they're all actors and shit. They all want to be on a movie set as extras, you know, with their guns shooting things up. They want to be consultants on these sets, telling people what they're going to, you know, what it's like to be a cop and let people lick their ass. But then they're also doing like security work. They're working at security companies and stuff like that, which they're advertising. Didn't you also find that they etch SIS in some of their weapons? Oh, man, it's fucking ridiculous. So first off, they carry six different weapons, right? And no, no. So it's not that they ask you. It's just, it's that the Glock will make them their special SIS guns. Oh, really? Which has SIS written in the side, which if you look at it, really looks like the Thunderbolts of of the SS Thunderbolts. Yeah. It really does, right? The Nazis. Yes. I mean, and it's too much of a coincidence. It's kind of, it's really fucking sick, right? Right. Um, But what we found is we started researching them up. We went beyond that. We said, you know what? let's dig and we spent a week dedicated just to digging up information on SAS and after a week we finally gave up because we were like it, it's it's never ending amount of information I mean one of these guys is SIS he's the He's anonymous, but you have him on news like six times as himself. He's in the audience of like some fucking talk show identifying himself he's he's he has an antique car that he's always boasting about. He's in fucking commercials for like Turtle Wax or some car wax company where he's buffing his car, showing his license plate in front of his own fucking house. Ugh. And you're going to tell me that I'm putting these cops at risk? And so we searched and searched and we, we there's just an abundance of information. It was a ridiculous amount. We found that the LAPD was sort of doxing them in their own paperwork. And so then we handed this information over Uh to the lawyers who were going up against the city attorney and they included this information. Good. It was built into their, their, uh, their documents. And listen, it was thrown out. It wasn't even needed because it was thrown out of court because the rule said, literally says if you want to claw back the, the photos, you have, I think she had 20 days Oh, really? Yeah, it's the law said. And she waited six months. Okay, so the police chief... (laughs) The police chief is... Corrupt. Worse than before. The police chief... Hold, is, hold on. I'm, I'm, I'm summarizing now. Okay. The city attorney, because I, I didn't like Mike Fuhrer. It's worse. It's worse. It's worse. Let's go over to the sheriff. Um, It's better. Well, low bar. No, no. I'm going to tell you why. Low bar, though. I'm going to tell you why. Go ahead. For one reason and one reason only. Yeah. Because he's fucking quiet. Okay? And I'm going to tell you why, why that's important. The sheriffs are obviously very corrupt, right? Talk about gangs, right? right. There's gangs in, in the LA, we, we, which we, we kind of knew thanks to Cerise. And then uh, the Spectrum TV uh, woman, Kate, interviewed the tattooist. You're not impressed by any of this. Cerise made a huge database. Oh, no, no, it wasn't very, no. Uh, Spectrum does the, the interview with uh, the tattooist. Believe it or not, LA Times actually found the shit first. LA Times has but done they their didn't work. talk. They don't. They didn't. They they didn't they, see value. They, they didn't go balls out on it. Well, listen, it's a gang, right? And you think, okay, that's a big fucking story, right? And you you know you, you don't write up any. How is it? How is it not a big enough story to actually write up? Right. So anyway, the thing about it is, you have these gangs, right? Does the LAPD have gangs? I don't know. Do they? Yes. We well, should assume they do. They have the equivalent or worse. Really? Listen, if you go to 
Rampart Station, and they have their logos and they have their clicks. So they're just not as sloppy. Seventy seventh has their their clicks. Uh-huh. Every fucking vice unit is a click. Why, their... do, why do any of them have gangs? They're already. What's the SIS? Gun. What's the SIS? SAS is a fucking gang. So is it just a brag thing saying our our unit is better than your unit? Is that what they're doing? What are they doing? They're going out there and they're living that life, that, that gangster life, and they're shooting people and then they're having barbecues celebrating it. And so are the LAPD. Yeah. So the, pro, the when Villanueva was sucking up all the oxygen, yeah. I will tell you this. Michael Moore is more corrupt than Villanueva. You re- really? Yes. Michael Moore, Villanueva. Well, uh, William just adjusted the microphone to get closer. Villanueva. <laughs> here's the craziest thing. And this is not to credit Villanueva. Okay? Yeah. Villanueva actually disciplined officers. He did? Oh, yeah. So if you look at the L.A. Sheriff's Department discipline reports, uh-huh. man, these motherfuckers get suspended for anything. Do you print these? Because I don't see They're any online. of these. But but you print the LAPD ones and you, you highlight it with your uh, red box. Oh, yeah, yeah. Box. But they're, they're all online, too. Do you give as much oxygen to those as to the sheriff's department? Yeah, no, because sheriff's department, I, 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 I have a narrow. I've given myself a narrow mandate of the LAPD and why, because that's who I run into. Okay, you know, I'm I, 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 I'm in Hollywood. Right. Listen, I live on the Hollywood West Hollywood border line. Right. If I go over to Plumbers Park looking for police stops, I'm not going to find many. And and you do call out the sheriffs when they come to Hollywood. You oh, say to bump up their big numbers. Prob- yes, that's that's a, a huge pet peeve of mine. Uh, listen, they they work to remove four deputies from the sheriff's department in right? West Hollywood. In West Hollywood, mm-hmm. and replace them with fifteen security ambassadors. Right. Uh-huh. So listen, some of the, some of the progressives don't think these security ambassadors are the greatest. But I say this is exactly who you want. You want an unarmed response, right? Yeah. You want guys on bikes who actually know the people that they're interacting with on a daily basis. So what are the critics? What's their issue with these people? Uh, I think. I, I, is I it think, ACAB? They just don't want anybody? I. I. I, I, <laughs> I can't figure everybody out, right? Yeah, listen, man. I just. Uh, do you want solutions or you just want to have a term that you want to live by? Do you want to actually have effects in people's lives? I mean, people can sit there and say, oh, no, I don't want to see any reforms. It's either, you know, get rid of the police or nothing. Well, listen, tonight black people are going to get pulled over down the street and I got to need to go protect them. And then, So so on this particular point and this point only, Mm -hmm. you would disagree with Richie? What does he say on this? He he would say he wants no cops. Well, I mean, these aren't cops, though. These are just. But would he, he would consider. I don't think he would have a problem with them. Do you consider a uh, uh, parking uh, uh, cops cops? Does a cab extend to for them for for the average a cab person? Yeah, but have you ever heard me say a cab? I have not. Never once. There you, you ever go. heard me call a cop a pig? I don't think I have. I never would. You have called them fat, oh. and you have insulted their bodies. Oh, I will tell you that. Oh, it's it's it's. <laughs> it, listen, I am not going to walk up to a cop walking down the street and say, "Hey, you know, you fat pig." I'm not. Right. If you threaten to arrest me, if you do some bullshit to me, yeah. oh, listen, I'm going to give you, I'm going to say whatever I want to say. Uh, you talked about people's if, mustaches, I believe. Look, how can you not? Come on now. That's all in good fun. And listen, the cops, when I'm making fun of mustaches, they laugh too. They are laughing. You know? Uh, they are laughing. A lot of times when I'm going off on a cop, the rest of the cops standing around are just dying laughing. They think it's funny. You know? And I'm just having my Which, fun. by the way, my biggest fear when I first saw your tweets was one of these guys are going to take you around the corner and pop you. And nobody's going to, nobody, nobody's, they're going to get away with it. Not and so my, my fear was, I, so I was trying to connect you with some LA Times people so that there could be features, whatever. It just it never happened. Huh. But to your credit, because you are so fearless out there and you are doing the right thing, your numbers have exploded. You're, mm-hmm. you're huge on, on all these platforms. And I'm just so grateful that you're safe and you, it doesn't seem like you've lost a step. Even with a, a bum leg, you're still out there hustling. You kidding me? I was out there. I, I broke my foot two nights. Two nights later, I was out there. And I had to make a point of it. Yeah. That I was going to be out there on Hollywood Boulevard, walking around with a, with one crutch. <laughs> Well, let me ask you this. 
other than Richie, mm -hmm. has there been an episode that you really loved? And I know you're very busy, and I'm putting you on the spot. Uh, listen, I I think that the one where you did the 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 ranger guy, the ranger, like the park ranger, or uh, oh yeah, I, yeah. He, he, I thought that was interesting because a cop, right? Yeah, SPCA. Actually, William C. Myself and a cat with news were actually talking about him. We were trying to decide. I probably shouldn't be mentioning this, but go ahead. Um, like you know, where do the where does like a ranger fit in the whole policing thing, right? Right. I don't think they're making pretextual stops, right? No. You know, it's he, well. I hope you heard from, and I haven't spoken to him in a long time. I hope you got from that interview that his heart is really with the animals. Yeah. So he doesn't care who's abusing the exactly. animals. He's there to protect the animals. Exactly. And uh, but also. Didn't he say he was one of like only a handful of uh, officers? Yeah, and for the whole county. Yeah, which is nuts because there's a lot of animals out there. Yeah, um, but you know I think there will be also be a fight. He is armed, so I think people. Are yeah, gonna, that surprised me too. I think people are gonna always feel like no, no, uh, no guns in parks. Yeah. So you know it's 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 complicated, but I thought that in, I personally thought that was my favorite episode oh, only good. because it made me think you know made me think about things a little differently yeah me too me too and and but i get the same feedback from you when um when i have to do my elevator pitch about what this uh podcast is to people in the back of my uber um i had i had an executive from spotify in there just the other day she was um uh at the pga and so I'm taking her from the PGA out to Pacific Palisades. And I was like, well, I'm on Spotify. And she's like, well, what's your show? And I explained. And she's like, well, who are the people? And I go, well, one of the most popular episodes was a guy who yells at the cops. And he's like, she's like, about what? And I was like, about all the right things. You're going to listen and you're going you're gonna to be shocked at how correct he is about his criticisms but you're also going to be shocked about his results. And I think that that's what makes you so much different than a lot of the other critics out there is that you've actually gotten results. Some. No, I mean, listen, I have gotten results. They tell me it, right? Uh -huh. I have my own goals, though, and I, I need to reach those goals. And I'm nowhere near it yet, but I think yeah. things are going to really start. Well, how many sustains? I don't know, 100 or so. Which would never have happened without you. I mean, listen, yeah, I, yeah, well, but I think that listen, I, I think I sustained a complaint against the cop for sleeping at the front desk, right? He got suspended for two weeks. Yeah. The co only one cop has been disciplined for blowing up Twenty Seventh Street. Right. And they got suspended two weeks. So how is it fair this guy for sleeping at the front desk gets two weeks and blowing up a neighborhood where those homes are still fucked up? And getting two weeks. There's a problem there. And so it's not about just holding them accountable. It's it, honestly now it's more about make putting what policing what policing looks like in front of people's faces. No one out there wants to criticize the cops. They want to have goodwill toward the cops. Everybody. Yes. And you can tell them how bad they are and they're not going to listen. You have to show it to them in their face over and over and over again and force them to say, OK. Because that's how the Civil Rights Act actually made real progress. When, he, when you saw people getting their ass beat on a fucking bridge on TV in Alabama. People who are dressed up in suits. Yeah. Kids. Yeah. You could no longer s sit by and pretend like you were unaffected. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me. Thank you for the work you do. You, you heard what my beautiful neighbor said to you. I did. What'd she say? Uh, she said something nice about it. She uh, said, thank, thank you for your service. Uh, yeah. It's pretty cool. <laughs> All right, my man. Thank you. Thank you, man. How great was William? You know, usually at this point, I read off of a, a little script, and um, I uh, thank all of our Patreons. I thank Jordan. I thank you. I tell you how you can give us money. And... Um, 
we're we're gonna we're gonna change stuff uh, from episode one oh one going forward. I I don't like the same old stuff over and over, um, but I do like you, and um, and so William, thank you for being our guest again. Um, I'm sure the listeners are happy to uh, get a little update from William, our superhero on the streets of Hollywood. Um, and I do want to thank our Patreons, Nancy Rommelman, Sean Atlow, Matt Mills, Sean Wallace, Greg and Molly, Jamie Taylor, Mark Johnson, Kira Ann up in Canada, Happy Canada Day, Barney Granke out in the, out in the world, Ben Welsh, wherever the heck he is. Jen Adams up north, uh, Trevor Wilson, who uh, writes about uh, uh, San Diego and Orange County, Bree Wild, who I think got me a job. I did sign a contract for a summer job. Thank you, Bree. Uh, Dougie Gyro out in Czech, Czech Republic, Christina up north, Robin Carey out in the desert, Adam Shorn holding it down, writing about weed in the LA Times. Uh, ben from Down Under, Chris from the ATX, Gregor. Um, thank you all. You uh, uh, you have no idea how uh, how nice it is to be supported by people you know and people that you don't know. Um, we do have a Patreon at patreon.com slash here in LA. Uh, I, I, if, if this summer job turns into more than a summer job, I'm not sure if I want to uh, shake down people for money. I, I'm, it, it's it's a very it's it's a very uncomfortable thing. It's a very awkward thing for me to ask for money, um, but it does help a lot. And because there are some expenses on this thing that, um, um, for example, I really want a good website, and uh, I want to pay Mark Johnson more uh, because. I, I just, I, I think of all these ideas and I can't do them myself and I need people like Mark Johnson and and who knows, maybe I'll have an idea that even Mark is going to say, we need another guy to do this or another woman to do this. And for example, one of the things, one of the ideas I have is I would love to have a photo uh, database archive of just cool stuff in L.A., and LA is so big that I can run around and take pictures, but I'm not the best picture taker. And uh, but you guys are. You guys can do it. And and I would I would love everybody to just as they take pictures to somehow be able to upload them onto uh, the Here in LA website and um, and make it all um, public domain. So anytime uh, somebody wants to do a blog post or write an article about a certain place they can come to here in LA and be able to use the picture without um, needing any permission or anything like that. Um, but that that's going to that's going to take money. Things take money, believe it or not. Things take money. And and that's that's where I want this this uh, this money to go is for for cool little projects that um, hopefully will benefit the good people of LA and the people who want to learn about LA. So I guess we'll keep the Patreon. See, see how I am. I talked myself into it. Um, I guess we'll keep the Patreon because I want to do cool things, things that don't exist. And it's weird that a, a, a beautiful database. Also, yes, I know that there's Flickr and I know that there's Instagram. But as we're watching with Twitter right now, th- these things don't last forever, and um, we're at kind of the mercy of either corporations or rich people and that's a terrible situation to be in um and and i promise you as long as as i live the stuff that i put up is gonna stay up i hate broken links um and it doesn't cost that much money to host stuff um so why not um so thank you everybody for these 100 episodes. It is hard to believe that we've done this now 100 times because it's not easy. It's not easy for Jordan. It's not easy for me. Um, but thanks to Jordan, it started. Thanks to Jordan, it's continued. 
Um, thanks to you and your love and your encouragement. I am somebody with very low self-esteem, so when anybody says anything nice, it feels really good for a short period of time, and then it fizzles away. So, um, but it does feel good, and it does keep me going. Um, so, thank you to all of you. Thank you to Jordan. Uh, Here in LA is produced by myself, Tony Pierce, and the amazing Jordan Katz, who I'm going to be giving a very short deadline to so that we can get this out on our birthday. I don't, I, I'm kind of nervous that he's going to be busy doing another podcast, but I hope he can fit in some time for this one. And this one's a longer one than normal. So thank you, thank you, thank you, Jordan Katz. Uh, who does the editing, mixing, and music supervision. He also did a bunch of songs along with Orgone. And here in LA would not exist without Jordan, so God bless you. Special thanks to Cindy, beautiful Cindy, for creating our logo. Thanks to beautiful Jen for inspiring this in Oz and Kim's backyard many moons ago. She was the first person to listen to my, <clears throat> my little dream and she was like, I would listen to that. And Jen has. And she likes our stuff on Facebook. She likes it on Twitter. And um, you have no idea how much a like on, on any of those things does for me personally, but also helps the algo. So on one hand, I don't really care if this thing becomes popular or not because for many years I had to worry about things being popular and that was annoying, and it um, got in the way of some of the stories that I wanted to do because I knew that those wouldn't be popular. And on this, I don't give one crap if if an episode doesn't get listened to personally. Uh, but I do give a crap because I, I do want people to hear from these nice Angelinos. So um, when you like it, when you retweet it, when you share it on your Facebook, um, you're giving love to somebody who spent some time with us. And that is that is the, the real goal, is to honor those people. So thank you for everybody who shares our stuff on Facebook, who says nice things, who tells their friends about it. Um, episode 100 is in the books. It's, and we did it in two years. That is, I, I, it, it, I'm, I'm sitting here speaking into this mic, and it, it, you have no idea all the work that it takes to do even one episode. So for us to do 100 in two years, again, I, I thank Jordan Katz so much. I, you know what, ladies, I'll see you at the bar. I need to produce a son, and I will name him Jordan, Jordan Katz. Katz.